six months ago I made my first ever device review about the HP EliteBook A40 G5. To be honest, I just started out and there were a lot of things I didn't know and I didn't actually mention about this laptop. Fast forward six months later, after editing 50 plus videos in CapCut, two videos in DaVinci Resolve which crashed like three times, and pushing this laptop to its limits in Photoshop, I can finally and confidently give you a solid review from the perspective of a long-term user. So without much talking, let's get into this video. If you're in the market to get a laptop, whether for programming or maybe you're a student or a business person, the HP EliteBook 840G5 is a consideration. Now in this video, I'm going to help you to decide if this laptop is good for you and is it worth your money? The HP EliteBook 840G5 was released back in November 2018 and was released with HP EliteBook series but in the mid-range section. The variant I have here with me has 16 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gig SSD storage. It's a 14 inch display with a max refresh rate of 60 Hz and uses the Intel Core i5 830U 8 gen processor with a speed of 1.7 GHz we're actually going to talk more about the specs as we get into the video. The design and build of the laptop is great. It's got an aluminum chassis which is stainless and it has these plastic frames for the bezels. This laptop is only 2 cm thick on its thicker side and as you can tell it's not very boxy. It has a 14 inch 1920 by 1080p display and a max refresh rate at just 60.01 Hz which isn't good for smooth gaming. The Intel USD graphics 620 paired with 8 gigs of graphics memory and 128 megabytes dedicated video memory makes the display on this laptop not something to complain about for the average user the bezels on the screen are large in themselves one centimeters on the left and right sides and two centimeters for the bottom part which holds the hp logo and the top which holds the microphone and the 720p HD webcam. The keyboard on this device is really comfortable. It's minimal, soft and not too small to type on. The coating on the keyboard is quite impressive. This is it after over a year of typing on it and it still looks good to me. The keyboard is also housed in this rectangular cutout which holds dust and particles and this isn't very pleasant. One thing you should notice is that the keyboard on the HP EliteBook 840 G5 should support backlighting on some variants. Still coming on that and to enable it you just have to press the f9 key the touchpad on this laptop hasn't disappointed me any bit it's responsive and it supports multi-finger gestures for scrolling zooming switching between desktops or windows and right clicking you can get away with the touchpad without having to press it down to click use a single tap for left click or two finger tap for a right click in the case you need to press down the touchpad to click the bottom left acts as the primary click button while the bottom right Right, acts as a secondary click button. You also get actual buttons at the top of the touchpad which is handy when it comes to clicking and scrolling. Not forgetting the pointing stick located between the G, H and B keys on the keyboard that acts as a backup cursor controller especially when your touchpad isn't responsive or your hands are perhaps oily or wet. The speakers on here are Bang and Olufsen. It's loud enough and produces good bass. I've gotten positive comments on the sound quality and the loudness of this speaker from people who just randomly hear sound coming out of it. Here's what it sounds like on YouTube. Let's look at how increasing chroma sampling will improve quality by recording more vivid colors in your videos. This device, even though it's quite slim, doesn't sacrifice much on ports. It has two USB 3.0 ports, one on the left and one on the right. I also noticed that the left port charges my phone faster than the right one. It also comes with a Thunderbolt port which can be used as a USB-C port or to just charge your laptop. An Ethernet port for connecting to a network, one HDMI port if you need to use a projector or connect to an external monitor through HDMI, a docking connector, a mic slash headphone jack, a smart card reader to insert smart cards like ATMs and an AC power port for charging. There's a port which isn't actually a port, it's called the Kensington lock. Now this basically helps you keep your laptop secured maybe if you're in a public space and you go out to get a cup of coffee for a few minutes. If you want to know how it works and even how to set it up, I'll leave a link to this video in the description just below the like button. 
there's a sim card port on this device as well you might be wondering what it's used for id2 well it turns out that it can be used for cellular data connectivity i read that your laptop will need to have a mobile broadband module and the laptop needs to support the sim card carrier i did try to download and install the set drivers but it didn't work out for me if you use a sim card on your laptop i would love to know how you made it work let's chat down in the comment section the fingerprint reader here is to the right of the touchpad just below the keyboard and it helps for a fast and convenient unlocking you can set up multiple fingers to unlock your device if you want to know how to set up a fingerprint on this laptop i'll leave a link to this video of mine in the description this device comes with a 720p webcam and this webcam isn't compatible with windows hello so you're basically just stuck with attending meetings and taking low resolution pictures but there's another variant that comes with an hd webcam which actually supports ai facial recognition as a biometric unlock feature some people don't realize this i didn't even realize it at first but they're actually many variants of this same laptop i don't know if it's based on location or maybe just economic policies but the following are not definitive to this laptop ai facial recognition is not available on all hp elitebook 840g5 laptops some variants come with an hd webcam and others come with a 720p webcam so if you're getting a laptop and ai facial recognition is something you're going to be using please do check it out as well the second thing is backlighting. Some of these variants don't come with backlighting, such as mine, and others do. If you want to know if the laptop actually has backlighting, check the F9 key on the keyboard. There's the touch and there's the non-touch. For you to differentiate between the touch and the non-touch variant of this laptop, you can look at the bezels. The non-touch variant has plastic bezels, while the touch variant has a complete screen. And also note that the touch variant does not come with this camera slider which helps for better security the fourth and last thing is refresh rate there are certain models that have 120 hertz refresh rate while this one is just stuck at 60 hertz my laptop has fallen a couple of times and it damaged a certain part in the left side of the hinge which made it wobble a lot for reference this is how a normal hinge compares to what mine actually looks like The screen has scratches which are caused by the aluminum finish on the left and right physical click buttons above the touchpad that rubs against it when the lid is closed. Another hardware issue I experienced while using this laptop is the limited number of USB ports. Whenever I'm working, I always have my phone plugged in and maybe a storage device like a flash drive or a hard disk drive and it leaves me with no space to connect any external device through USB. I know a lot of laptops these days are taking away more ports by the day, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. When it comes to performance, this laptop is powered by Intel's Core i5 A30U processor. It's an 8 gen processor with 4 cores and with a speed of up to 1.7 GHz which you can actually increase it to 1.9 using Turbo Boost. It also comes with 16 gigabytes of RAM coupled with its 256 gig SSD storage. The performance in general hasn't disappointed too much, but I you basically use this laptop for researching, graphics designing, and video editing. When it comes to graphics designing, Photoshop is the go-to application. Now, this laptop has had a couple of lags here and there while using Photoshop, but on the general scale, it has been great. With the exception of upscaling images, Whenever I finish designing and I want to upscale an image for large format printing, I usually have this scratch disk error that always pops up. This problem is a storage problem, so if you're going to be doing graphics designing and it's going to require you to have large files, make sure you go for the 512 gig SSD storage variant. For video editing, I've actually installed three video editing software on this device, Premiere Pro, CapCut, and DaVinci Resolve. I haven't edited a full video using Premiere so I'm not going to test its performance in Premiere but I've used CapCut and DaVinci Resolve. On CapCut throughout my time of editing using this laptop it has held up quite well. I've experienced just a few lags there but it was corrected by using proxy and reducing the resolution on playback speed. I actually had this laptop crash 
maybe twice because I had a Photoshop file opened, many Chrome tabs opened, and even had an adjustment layer with color grading active. So I was actually pushing it beyond its limits. But if you're going to be using it for basic video editing, CapCut, you should be fine. The first time I installed DaVinci Resolve on this laptop, I actually thought to myself that, damn, I'm going to teach CapCut. But that wasn't the case. Hear me out. When I installed DaVinci Resolve, I never knew how to use the software, so I was basically using all files at full resolution, no proxy media and anything. So the playback speed was pretty bad. I mean, it was extremely bad. I tried editing this video about everything you need to know in CapCut right inside DaVinci Resolve. And to be honest, the experience was not the best. I couldn't go back to CapCut because I was already too deep into the editing process, so I just decided to continue with DaVinci Resolve. After editing the video, experiencing lags here and there, and exporting the video, I ran out of storage. And the first thing I did was uninstall DaVinci Resolve and go back to CapCut. But before recording this video, I actually downloaded Resolve to make a proper test on this laptop. Here's what I'm going to do. This video I'm actually recording is going to be edited with DaVinci Resolve, including the vlog which I am doing on how I've shot this video and all the experiences throughout the editing process will be in that vlog. So subscribe so you don't miss that video. Now, am I saying this laptop isn't good for video editing? Somewhat, yes, but it's good if you're going to be using CapCut. The controversial thing here is CapCut is getting premium by the day. Most laptops with good battery don't always have great performance. This laptop doesn't have great performance, but it still holds up well when it comes to battery, even after six years. After watching Moana 2, which is an animated film of about an hour and 40 minutes long, it dropped from 67% to 46, which is about a 21% drop in battery. If you're watching videos offline or doing light tasks like emails and projects, this laptop can take you for a little over six hours. It takes a little over 35 minutes to charge from zero to 50% with its 65 watt charger. Like I said, this is a six year old laptop and you shouldn't expect great battery when it comes to heavy workload. And also note that for it to get the best performance out of this laptop and any other Windows laptop, you have to use it plugged in. Why? 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 That's just the reality. One thing you should ask yourself before considering to buy this laptop is the price. If you want to buy this laptop, there are several things you should consider because of how diverse this laptop is with the variants such as the Core i5 or i7, the CPU speeds that range from 1.7 to up to 4.2 gigahertz, the touch and the non-touch variant, one with an AG webcam with support for AI facial recognition, 8, 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM, 256 or 512 or even a terabyte of storage and the list goes on. What I would advise is that you weigh how much you need certain features and decide if that laptop is worth the money it demands. Using this video as a base to decide. Nonetheless, on Amazon, depending on the variant you want and the specs, you can get this laptop for around $200 to $300, even though some vendors might charge as high as $700 for the i7 or 1TB or the Touch variant. With price already looked at, let's talk about the bigger question. Who should use this laptop in 2025? If you are a student, business person, a programmer, or maybe just going to buy a laptop for personal use, this laptop should be good for you. But if you're going to be doing heavy graphics designing, video editing, you should definitely go for the i7 variant with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigs of SSD storage to begin with, or you should just go for something better. Now, if you're looking for a laptop specifically for graphic designing, video editing, or programming, the things you need to look out for when getting it, and some of my personal laptop recommendations for these three categories, I recommend you check out this video right here. Thank you all so much for watching. Until next time, Happy New Year, T4Tech.